we're in a planetary emergency. Um, and uh, the other thing to, to keep in mind here is that we face multiple threats. Climate change uh, is only one of many. Uh, biodiversity loss, of course, is very closely related to climate change, but also should be treated as an independent problem. In other words, if we somehow solved, uh, 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 solved climate change through decarbonization, we would still face uh, a threat of mass extinction. Um, because that arises from, um, from uh, separate factors um, beyond climate change, meaning land use change and the pressures of it of that capitalism puts on the biosphere. In this podcast, I speak with Frederick Alberton Johnson, a history professor at the University of Chicago. He has a book out with Carl Wendland, who I also had on the podcast, called Scarcity. A history from capitalism to the origins of the climate crisis. And it's that which we discuss today. We look at climate change, its history, how we got here today, and what our future holds. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. Maybe we could start at the Industrial Revolution. How did that start? Take us back there. How does it start and why do we suddenly have economic growth sort of out of nowhere? Hmm. Um, hi, hi, Jack. Thanks so much for having me on uh, on this podcast. Really appreciate the invitation. Um, uh, before I answer your question, let me just um, uh, explain where I'm coming from um, into intellectually and methodologically. So mm -hmm. I was trained in intellectual, cultural and environmental history. Um, and I've long had interests beyond that in in um, economics, in the environmental sciences, in earth system science, in anthropology. Uh, so, so um, my perspective is is fundamentally that of an historian, but uh, informed by other disciplines. And um, you know, I think it's very important for this topic, thinking about energy and climate, that even hu humanity scholars like myself try to be as scientifically literate and as respectful of the science as they can. Um, uh, so, it, it, as you probably know, um, there is a very long standing debate about the origins of, of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I don't claim to have a definitive answer to, mm -hmm. to what happened, but I can sketch for you just briefly um, some of the arguments um, that come into play. Uh, one is uh, a materialist, um, materialist and environmental argument uh, that industrialization is fundamentally about the transition to a mineral energy economy, as as Tony Wrigley, the economic historian of energy, would have it. Um, uh, so, so what really matters is the move from um, the uh, medieval. Um, agrarian economy um, that depends essentially on photosynthesis with supplements of wind and water power um, for all its energy needs to an economy that's fundamentally dependent on the, let's say, the lithosphere or the mineral endowment of, of um, uh, uh, iron, coal and other minerals. Um, and so we move from a world of, uh, of flows and cycles of regenerative energy to one of depending on a finite stock of coal and iron. Um, so that's one, that's, that's one position. Another diametrically opposed position is that industrialization is fundamentally a shift in how we think about science and human knowledge and its application uh, in technology. Uh, a, a good uh, articulation of this, maybe the most famous and, and best one, is uh, by Joel Mokir. Uh, um, Mokir uh, defines the Enlightenment um, in these terms as a moment when um, information about uh, science and technology begins to circulate more and more widely. And where the where access to information, uh, where the cost of access is substantively lowered um, through publishing, through um, ventures like the Encyclopédie. Um, uh, so, so for Mokir, um, 
the mere fact of scarcity and 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 a description of a material process like the burning of coal to power steam um is never going to provide an exhaustive answer for for the uh, the question of industrialization because it's fundamentally about human ingenuity the development of human ingenuity and the mastery of the earth uh with the help of that ingenuity uh, so, so uh, slightly simplifying things, you could say we're we're faced on the one hand with an environmental energy um, um, perspective, and on the other hand with um, uh, one that uh, that that sees human ingenuity almost in transcendental terms as as a force uh, that can master everything. Um, Mokir goes so far as to suggest that um, that coal and steam were wholly incidental to industrialization. That if if Britain had not had coal or had not been able to exploit it, um, it would have found another way. Interesting. So, scientific ideas and the sort of capacity for us to think that we can start changing the world at around that time seems to be the most important. So, could you speak a bit about? how there is, it seems to be then a shift in ideas and the way we think about the world sort of around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And so what was it like to think before that? How did people conceive of their place in the world? And then how does that change so that we get the kind of growth that we sort of suddenly get at that time? Uh, together with my co-author, Carl Vanderlind, um, we sketch... Um, we sketch a way to think about this by way of intellectual history. Um, and I want to stress that there are there are other powerful interpretations available. Um, uh, but we su we suggest that in the 17th century, um, with the rise of what we now think of as uh, modern science and the scientific revolution, um, or in their terms, natural philosophy and alchemy and mechanical philosophy, um, we get a new worldview. We get a new notion of human power, um, particularly in, in, uh, in Francis Bacon, uh, the natural philosopher of the early 17th century, um, uh, and also in his followers, the, uh, the network of alchemists and natural philosophers uh, uh, that uh, gathered around um, the savant um, Samuel Hartlib in the middle of the 17th century. Um, the founding of the Royal Society in, in the 1660s marks another stage here. But, but just to speak, speak to the very origin of this, in, um, in the Baconian worldview, uh, say in Bacon's text, The New Atlantis, or in The Great Instauration, uh, the project is to learn um, how to imitate God, um, to learn from God how to master the world. Um, so divine knowledge and divine power uh, are considered within the remit of humanity, or, or at least of the natural philosopher. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a fundamental change compared to to. Um, uh, to the much more modest conception of humanity and human power that came before it. Um, um, Bacon essentially is suggesting that um, we can have infinite knowledge and infinite power um, if, uh, if, if we only can find the right method um, to, to exploit the world. Um, so, so here, uh, nature is no longer an overwhelming force that restrains human agency that keeps us down, but rather a storehouse of resources um, that we can employ uh, to reshape society. Um, Bacon himself isn't, you know, he's not speaking in terms of uh, GDP or uh, any of the metrics of growth that we have uh, developed in later times. Um, uh, but he's very clear that this this project marks a, a fundamental change in our in our relation to nature. Um, and I don't think I think the the idea of imitating God tells you all you need to know about this. It 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 the aspiration is is to grapple grapple with the infinite. Uh, now he's doing so within his, the um, 
within the horizon of his own time, um, the horizon of available technology, of the social structure, of, of the forms of knowledge available to him. Um, so we shouldn't expect him to be talking about, say, uh, interstellar travel or, or DNA at this point. Um, uh, we have to be careful to see that each, uh, each conception of growth whether you're looking at Bacon or, or Adam Smith or Marx or Solo um, or Elon Musk, in each of these cases, uh, the, idea, uh, the, the idea of dynamic growth uh, depends on the technologies and the social structures of, of, the, of the moment. I, Carl and I use the umbrella term cornucopianism to describe the fundamental kinship between between all these different positions. They, they vary and they're, they're, they're historically determined, but there's also a, a sort of kindred uh, affinity between them. Um, and again, to put it very bluntly, uh, they all aspire to uh, articulate um, a, an idea of dynamic growth that will go on infinitely or indefinitely. Uh, and, and that's based on a confident mastery of nature and um, uh, a recognition that human desire um, is, is in itself a dynamic force. Um, many of them uh, uh, see, see growth as a confluence of mastery plus insatiability. Interesting. You know, we'll get into sort of those ideas as they develop after the scientific sort of revolution but i'm interested in to go back to this point of francis bacon and people thinking that they can start changing the world what is it like to live in a world before them how are people conceiving of the world when there isn't growth and we don't think that there is this kind of abundance and we can start sort of creating and changing the world to our benefit uh yeah uh, um obviously early modern history uh is very much uh a project to describe that kind of world because keep in mind the cornucopian position is actually outlandish um, and um, and strange to the majority of the population for a very long time so when i say cornucopianism uh, emerges with bacon and the heart libyans i'm really talking about a, mi a minority position uh, um, that is scorned by many uh, in the I even in the elites um, and and uh, one might even say that uh, the uh, the moral philosophers and political economists of the enlightenment um, are articulating their own sense of progress very much in in a critique of Hartlib and Bacon and and what they perceive to be a kind of the exaggerated hopes of the 17th century. So in other words, um, the articulation of cornucopianism uh, could be understood as a dialectic, as a back and forth between different uh, intellectual factions. Um, and it's really not until the Industrial Revolution and the transition into the fossil fuel economy that it begins to become a dominant intellectual, social, and political position, um, and obviously we're, we're still we're still in the early modern phase here. But um, I would say uh, uh, the the worldview, the, the cornucopianism becomes a worldview for the masses uh, in the twentieth century, and, and really probably fundamentally only after World War Two. Interesting. Um, yeah, so so I mean, I could, we can we can talk about late medieval um, notions of um, the agrarian um, and finite world, if you like. That would be one way to to think about this. But we can also trace uh, anti cornucopian positions throughout uh, the modern era. Uh, for example, in in uh, romantic ideas of scarcity or Malthusian ideas of scarcity. Uh, so it's not. Um, it's not that we move uh, in a sort of binary switch from a finite world to an infinite world around 1600. Okay, well, would you be able to sort of paint a picture of thinkers, whether it be Adam Smith and you mentioned Malthus and 
economic developments like the marginal revolution. Could you maybe, even if you're not going into details, touch on this back and forth and, and, and how we get up to our, our sort of present day, if, if that's not too big a task and break that down how you want? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try, and um, we'll focus on Smith and Malthus, since I know something about those two. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Smith is um, is optimistic about the human prospect, um, but unlike Bacon and the Hart Lee, but rather as an almost insensible, gradual, incremental process um, that uh, uh, begins not in top-down science and utopian ventures, but in uh, the innate propensity of all human beings to, to strive for their betterment. And within a certain institutional structure um, that protects private property um, and allows for the play of, uh, of markets, um, for free markets, um, uh, this this innate propensity will will produce very impressive results over time. Um, that said, Smith uh, Smith has two kinds of futures in mind. Um, insofar as he talks about the future, uh, he looks to the Dutch Republic, like like many British thinkers um, of the period. The Dutch Republic stands out as as the most sophisticated, most developed economy. Uh, there is. Um, he clearly thinks uh, the Dutch are still ahead in some ways. Uh, but interestingly, he points out that the Dutch Republic has reached the full complement of its natural riches. It has developed all the resources at its disposal. Um, and, and one way uh, uh, we can know uh, that an economy has reached this stage of maturity is that interest rates are now falling, um, such that uh, people can no longer live as rentiers um, on interest alone. Everyone is pushed uh, to be as industrious as, as um, they can in order to get by. Um, this is not a bad thing. Th this is a good thing. But it means that the Dutch Republic represents a kind of final stage of development um, where growth slows down. Um, it is in, in, um, in later classical economics, in, in John Stuart Mill, uh, this stage is, is uh, described as the stationary state, um, as a moment where uh, we, we, um, we simply exhaust uh, the, uh, the potential of nature. Smith, Smith um, sees the Dutch option as one future, uh, but, but uh, a far more dynamic and more optimistic account than Smith comes from his view of North America. Um, in North America, we get um, a, um, uh, a world where um, capitalism, agrarian capitalism, agricultural improvement, urbanization is only in its early stages, um, and where there's far more land uh, than people still. Uh, so, uh, so Smith, I think, insofar as Smith sees a long-term prospect of growth, it lies in Atlantic trade and it lies on the other side of the of the Atlantic in North America. Now, notice here that uh, 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 Smith uh, has very little to say about the social cost of this prospect. Um, he is pretty coy about the reality of slavery. And um, uh, he doesn't really have uh, a moral account of, um, of genocide, of um, displacement of Native American people um, in this process. So, so, so those are those are Smith's two futures. If I had time, I would. Th there's actually a third one, um, um, uh, which is a sort of bad bad future uh, of of the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese Empire. Um, uh, but anyway, if people are interested, um, you know, uh, you, you feel free to go to the West I mean, and, and, <laughs> and look up China. Uh, right. uh, now, uh, Malthus, uh, Malthus is writing just a generation after Smith. So the Wealth of Nations comes out in 1776. Um, Malthus, first edition of the S. Uh, for Malthus, 
the question of growth and limits um, uh, is reoriented uh, towards what he sees as the tragic propensity of poor people to procreate beyond their means. Um, uh, and he recognizes the positive force of uh, self-improvement, of, of, um, the sort of um, the Smithian, uh, um, the Smithian picture I just described. Um, but he's worried that um, that sexual instinct, uh, when it's not guided by foresight, um, will overcome and stifle this this force of industry. Um, uh, so in in in, in Malthus, um, we see uh, a much harsher um, version of the stationary state and and the limits to growth. Um, in basically in the form of a tragic contradiction between sexual desire and the finite supply of land. Um, for 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 Malthus, uh, the acceleration uh, of the British economy, the the obvious growth. Um, of manufacturers and industry um, is undermined by an even faster growth in population, such that uh, Malthus, even though he's living through the Industrial Revolution, um, doesn't really see industrialization as a liberation. Um, he worries that um, uh, a a any human ingenuity can, can be quickly undercut um, by uh, by population, by the force of population. Both those thinkers have different views about the benefits, but also the costs of growth. And maybe even though they come at it from different angles and also drawing on different experiences, I'm wondering, wondering what you think about what we can do today in terms of the benefits and costs of growth. Maybe it would be helpful to talk about what you think about climate change first mm. and how we should contextualize that, what do people get wrong about it, and maybe it was linking to our thinking about what we've just said about how we get to this er era where we can sort of imagine mm -hmm. infinite or growth continuing. So would you be able to contextualize climate change in this context? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, one, one of the profound ironies um, of uh, the history of ideas of growth um, is that... Um, uh, in the 18th century and in the 19th century, um, as, I, as I just mentioned, economic growth becomes increasingly um, a majority position. Um, you know, it, it goes from a kind of wild-eyed, alchemical uh, minority view uh, to one embraced by the middle class um, and eventually by, uh, you know, just about everyone in, in affluent societies. How did that happen? Well, um, uh, the shift into a mineral energy economy, the shift into a fossil fuel economy, um, cheap energy um, allowed for new standards of living, of course, and um, a palpable sense of economic growth, right? Not, not Smith's insensible incremental improvement, but uh, uh, breathtaking leaps. Um, uh, coal and steam and canals uh, did something to, uh, to expose people to growth, but even more so, I think, the late 19th century and the so-called uh, the, the second industrial revolution centered on, on uh, new forms of engineering, chemistry, um, and uh, new, uh, new forms of power, um, hydropower, electrification, uh, natural gas, and of course, petroleum. Um, but you see, you, you probably can see where I'm going with this. So the irony here is that uh, growth becomes thinkable, become, begins to uh, look like common sense exactly at the moment when um, carbon emissions begin to uh, uh, um, change uh, the nature of the climate and the Earth system. Changes in, um, in temperature uh, don't register fully until the 20th century. Um, but if we're just looking at atmospheric concentrations of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, um, we know that 
we diverge from the Holocene norm, from the natural variability of atmospheric carbon, sometime in the late 19th century. Uh, in other words, exactly at the moment of uh, the marginalist uh, revolution of, of Promethean socialism is where the seeds of the Anthropocene are sown. Um, so our entire, our entire way of life ha uh, uh, has produced um, a, an unintended consequence at the planetary scale, um, which we don't become fully aware of really until um, until the late twentieth century. Um, climate science uh, has roots in the nineteenth century, of course, but um, I think it's fair to say the, the danger of anthropogenic climate change of um, carbon emissions only becomes clear in the eighties, in the late in the late nineteen eighties. And so insofar as we want to draw a line between unintended consequences and let's say intended carbon emissions, it would have to be drawn somewhere there. Is our current impact on the world, and we can sort of debate about how much that is, but the fact that we are at least way bigger and more impactful now as a civilization, is it unprecedented? What about the past? How have you thought about nature and have humans been able to impact nature on a, a scale like we do today? Well, uh, uh, there's a debate about this. Um, um, I'll just mention two hypotheses. Um, one is that uh, the beginning of agriculture in the Neolithic, um, the taming of livestock, and clearing of land, deforestation, drainage, agriculture, uh, contributed to an uptick in greenhouse gases. So that um, on, on, this, um, on this interpretation, um, we, we were sort of warming the planet uh, as we were um, spreading agriculture around the world. Um, uh, a second hypothesis um, is that somewhere around uh, the start of the 17th century, uh, as a consequence of the Columbian exchange, the discovery, the European discovery and exploitation of the New World, um, the collapse of Native American society in the New World um, uh, uh, had the ecological consequence of um, drawing down carbon, of expanding carbon sinks, through afforestation or reforestation, um, so that um, uh, so that the little ice age, um, the cooling of the climate in the seventeenth century, um, actually could be seen to have an anthropogenic cause. So those are those are two hypotheses made about the influence of humans on on climate before the present moment. They're both controversial positions. I think they're not, they're definitely not majority uh, views among climate scientists. Uh, much more common uh, is the idea that, as I just said, it's really only in the 19th century that we begin to see an impact of human uh, burning of fossil fuel as a consequence of industrialization and land clearance on a large scale uh, around the world. Um, and that, uh, that before that moment in time, climate is, is uh, natural, is, is a physical force um, that um, is not uh, within the realm of human impact, of human influence. Um, so when we, when we talk about anthropogenic climate change, that's essentially what what we have in mind. Um, uh, now, it, it, that's a very blunt tool, right? We, then the next question has to be clearly, what are the historical causes of anthropogenic climate change uh, from the 18th, 19th centuries on? Um, uh, you know, to, um, to what degree is this uh, an event propelled by imperialism, by colonialism, by industrialization, uh, by land use change from uh, new forms of uh, um, a dietary change um, 
in 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 Europe and North America, you know. Um, and here we can, I mean, again, the the this is a a, a hugely controversial topic. Um, um, but I think most historians agree with the climate scientists that anthropogenic warming is a relatively recent um, uh, recent event. That's uh, that's very interesting. That actually, I didn't expect that que question to be actually so difficult, right? So actually, historians are kind of grappling with the fact that we're not exactly sure how much we have impacted things in the past, and moreover, even today, it's hard to know exactly what is contributing to most the most to the world now. Is it changes in diet? Is it the spreading of cultures and people across the world and colonialism? Is it um, industrial? Realization and things like this. Given there are, given that there are not only there, there there are problems, but there's also, as you say, it's also hard to quantify and it's hard to think about these things. And as we've been talking about, it's messy these debates about different ideas about what kind of growth and what kind of society we should have. What do you think? And I know it's a big question. What do you think should be done today? What do you think about ideas of continuing to grow? What kind of growth should we have? Should we stop economic growth? Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, um, I don't think it's very helpful to be absolutist about uh, whether or not we should have growth. Um, a lot depends on um, how events unfold in the next few decades and and beyond that. And what I mean by that is is as follows. Um, we are in a situation where a minority of the world's population uh, is producing carbon emissions um, that jeopardize the entire safe functioning of the Earth system. Uh, so it's not a Malthusian problem. Um, in in uh, the book I, I just um, published with Carl Venerlind, uh, we call this phenomenon planetary scarcity. Uh, again, it's it's uh, it's a function of overconsumption by a minority of the world's population, and and and, and that means that um, tragically, uh, the more the fossil economy spreads to um, to countries outside OECD, outside uh, the West, um, the greater pressure we put on the Earth system, the more we accelerate climate change. Um, so uh, and 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 uh, you know it, um, the worst possible scenario would be one where we where we basically hit not just one but multiple tipping points and push the planet into uh, runaway warming um, um, until we jeopardize uh, not just the lives of vulnerable people but uh, but the entire species and all other species with with us. Uh, so it's really it it it's we this is the great problem of our time. Um, we're in a planetary emergency, um, and uh, the other thing to to keep in mind here is that we face multiple threats. Climate change uh, is only one of many. Uh, biodiversity loss, of course, is very closely related to climate change, but also should be treated as an independent problem. In other words, if we somehow solved uh, 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 solve climate change through decarbonization, we would still face uh, a threat of mass extinction um, because that arises from um, from uh, separate factors um, beyond climate change, meaning land use change and the pressures of it of that capitalism puts on the biosphere. Um, so, what can we do? Um, well, we have to uh, transition to to uh, renewables, um, uh, if if we can, it would also be wonderful if we could somehow um, somehow purge the atmosphere of the excess carbon we have put into it um, th by artificial means or uh, natural means. So, in other words, if we could uh, um, build artificial sinks or natural sinks capable of sequestering. Uh, the uh, atmospheric carbon. So we could we could draw down the carbon uh, uh, concentrations to a level closer to the Holocene uh, norm of natural variability um, that we left behind in in the late nineteenth century. Um, now, 
side by side with this problem, uh, as if this wasn't a big enough project, we also have to figure out how to how to share the planet, how to share the oceans and the earth with non-human species. Um, and it seems uh, to be a problem of um, that conflicts with decarbonization insofar as decarbonization will force us to rely on land extensive forms of energy, right? Solar panels, wind, all of that takes up room. But so does biodiversity. Um, so how can we how, how can we can we find a way to, to reconcile those two? Um, all of this has to happen on a fairly uh, f uh, short time scale. Um, we shouldn't make a fetish out of any particular number. I think every increment of change uh, uh, is, uh, it, it matters here, right? The sooner we can stop fossil emi uh, carbon emissions, the better for us. But all of this will have to happen within the next generation or two. Um, and it's going to take an enormous amount of work um, of new, ki new kinds of infrastructure, uh, massive engineering projects. And if things go wrong, then we may have to resort to uh, to even bigger gambles like geoengineering. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit I'm hesitant to say we, we need to stop growth at this point. Um, it seems to me uh, growth is built into the very idea of a transition. Uh, but let me speak to the other side of this, which is uh, you'll often hear now the argument that um, if only we could freeze uh, uh, fossil growth around the world uh, by stopping consumption, by, by halting unnecessary growth, um, we could take a big slice out of carbon emissions. Um, uh, there's, there's something to that, um, but, but you come up against two massive challenges. One is how on earth will we persuade the public that this is a good thing when we have for the last couple of generations um, oriented politics around the promise of growth in uh, in democracies as well as in um, in other forms of uh, political regimes um, and and secondly um, even if somehow we could convince um, Western affluent citizens to to um, to stop growth, it's also obvious to me that um, uh, the global south uh, has to be given the space to catch up, at least to some extent, with with the OECD countries. Somehow, by uh, by magic, impose degrowth on the West. Um, I think it, it, in 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 the name of social and environmental justice of global justice, we'd have to allow growth uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, so you see, you see how tangled all of this is. I'm interested. You mentioned geoengineering there, uh, changing sort of our environment actively, and you also mentioned you're working on carbon sinks. I mean, if we deem that there is a problem, like there is too much CO two and whatnot. What do you think of the idea that then we, since we're changing things already, we, we, we may as well actively change things? Or, for example, like if there are benefits of higher temperatures or higher, higher CO2, which may be more arguable for temperatures, but maybe more CO2 is better for like plant growth. So I'm wondering what you think about that. Should people be actively interfering with the planet? And if we're kind of in a way already doing that, how does that change the debate? Yeah. Um... We are already interfering, um, that's true. And the contrast I drew uh, a moment ago between the unintended consequences of carbon emissions and this moment of political awakening to carbon emissions in the late 80s and on uh, tells you that we have been tampering with the system um, knowingly for some time. Um, uh, what, it, what worries me about geoengineering uh, is that it's... Um, it's an experiment with out president without any um, any kind of experience uh, of the consequences on a planetary scale um, and um, it, it worries me also as a uh, um, yet another uh, version of uh, the idea of a technical fix 
Um, we've had, uh, we have in, in the history of technology and history of planning, a long, long sequence of these technical fixes that turn out to have a devastating uh, consequences for the environment. Um, so it seems to me one of the one of the takeaways from uh, t uh, thinking historically about this is that we've unleashed one set of planetary unintended consequences through industrialization. Maybe it behooves us to 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 be a little more careful about um, imagining technical solutions to what I think are you know fundamentally social and political problems. Um, uh, now, it, it may still come to geoengineering as plan B. Um, it, it's possible that things will get so bad that um, geoengineering will, will, um, will seem the obvious option. And I note that geoengineering, um, depending on the path you take, is relatively inexpensive compared to, at least in its initial phases, compared to uh, decarbonization. Um, so there's kind of a cost benefit issue here too. Um, uh, on, on carbon as a uh, fertilizer of, of vegetation, I think, you know, this is kind of a standard position among people who are either denying uh, the negative effects of climate change or, um, you know, who uh, wish to postpone the process of decarbonization. So I, I think it's uh, we have to take that with a great grain of salt. There may be, it may be that um, countries in northern latitudes um, uh, uh, stand to benefit for a time um, from uh, from warming uh, warming climate. But just remember that um, it's going to be very hard for any country to insulate itself from the global impacts. Um, we are. Uh, probably looking at tens, if not hundreds of millions of climate refugees by mid-century. Um, do you really think we can keep them put where they are in the, in, in, in the killing zones, in, in the hot climates? How northern countries will, will escape the larger problem um, and, and even benefit? What do you think of... Well, you, you talked about sort of slowing growth, and you have some writing about what life might be like if we did have less economic growth or, or none. So can you talk a bit about that? What, what might life be like if in a world where there was no growth? Hmm. Um, well, um, growth is a relatively recent idea, as, as, as we've been saying now um, in the course of this conversation. Um, it, um, it has become common sense and second nature in uh, in the last few generations, maybe let's say after World War II, um, in in Western countries, and and maybe after uh, after the 90s in uh, in um, in China um, and India, uh, uh, so overturning the idea of growth uh, wouldn't it wouldn't be such a uh, strange thing uh we're only a few generations removed from a from a world of agrarian rhythms of, of relatively static economies um uh, now that's not the same thing as saying um uh, such a result is desirable obviously um uh, uh growth economic growth um technological change electrification has played a major role in the expansion of uh, human um, human rights, human liberty, um, of development that we all now take for granted um, as more or less entitlements. Um, uh, for example, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to articulate the defense of. Um, of women's rights, of, of feminism, um, whether it's first, second, or third wave, without electrification, um, without the changes that have come to, to, the, to the home. Um, uh, uh, so, so I think it's too simple uh, and, um, and really uh, dangerous to wish for a, a return to the past um, of, say, um, 
agrarian society 1800 or or 1500 um uh, but there are historical lessons that um are maybe worth highlighting um one of them is the question of what makes for a good life um uh, a good life uh, in in many ways is tied around uh questions of of um uh, social and um cultural needs that may or may not have a strong material base um uh, right uh, um family friends love um spiritual fulfillment sexual fulfillment um i think it's possible to imagine a society where we reorient some of our wants and needs towards that sphere, um, a sphere that's relatively decoupled from, from the material world. Um, uh, the, the, the theorists of degrowth uh, make a distinction between um, uh, public affluence and private frugality that might also be useful here um so we could um if if we just uh, rearrange uh our understanding of property we might we might see affluence in a different light um uh, what, would, what would that mean so public affluence private what, what would that entail um well um for example um a society uh, such as really um the 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 current infrastructure of many western european uh countries where uh there is strong public support for public um, transport um where urban planning uh creates uh densities of population and services um you know you might think of, of, of a modern city um as a zone of shared affluence of that kind. Um, it, I'm not saying um, I'm not saying places like Stockholm or Amsterdam are perfect examples of this kind of future, but they you might think of them as a step in the right direction. I see. Compared to say uh, to say where I live, Chicago, um, or or New York. Right. So you have you still have wealth and and say prosperity, but it's more public and shared rather than caring so much about so sort of that private consumption. That's interesting. Hmm. You have anything else to say? And and if not, I've I've really enjoyed um, talking with you. And so I, I was wondering, maybe where can people find your book? Where can people find more information about you? Uh, well, I have a website at the University of Chicago where you can look up um, um, some of my. Uh, publications. You can also find them on researchgate.edu. Uh, um, and I would say, uh, but, but, but rather than um, bang my own drum here, let me just say that uh, whatever, uh, whatever ideas I've articulated here are really part of a much larger conversation with many, many colleagues, uh, including, of course, my, my co-authors, Carl Vennerlind and Vicky Albritton. Um, but you know, I'm I'm glad to say there's uh, there's a really dynamic uh, movement in environmental history and history of science that is grappling with these questions of growth and climate change in in wonderful new creative ways. Um, uh, if I could just recommend a few names, I would mention, for example, um, the environmental historian Bathsheba de Muth. Who, uh, whose first book is a is a, a milestone on the floating coast, um, and another important environmental historian, um, Chris Otter, uh, whose book "Diet for a Large Planet: World Changing Consequences of of the 19th Century Dietary Transition." So I, I can go on, but that that yeah, go, go on if you want. There's nice recommendations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one, one final thing is uh, for people like students or young people studying these these areas. What should they they study, and how how should they try and approach these kinds of admittedly very complex issues? Well, you're not going to be surprised to hear. I th I think a historical perspective is really crucial. Um, uh, it, it's lacking in many of the social sciences, unfortunately. So, I suppose I would. 
encourage people, whatever path you take, whatever career you take, whatever educational uh, uh, path you're on, to read widely, um, to uh, try to stay abreast of climate change and ecology, um, uh, and also um, subscribe to podcasts on energy policy um, and uh, and and follow up with environmental historians and their their perspective on on the longer on the deeper roots. Uh, there's a tendency to see the present uh, planetary emergency uh, as beginning in the 20th century. And I, I think I strongly disagree with that. I, as, as, as you heard in the last hour, I think we have to go much farther back in order to dissect the causes of, of the predicament we're in. Okay, awesome, so thank you. Of, some mixture of uh, innovative economics, uh, energy policy, um, historical perspectives and earth system science, I think is the right way to go. Thank you, Frederick. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jack. Great to be with you.